of things are complicated, um, especially in the climate space. But what we are trying to achieve, uh, for instance, at Mukuru, is to provide a stove that is able to reduce emissions, essentially reduce carbon emissions. And so if we can leverage carbon credits to ensure that we get that stove into as many households at pos as possible, as long as there is accountability, you know, and as long as, again, you're focusing on impact, not the amount of money you could make from that, it's always very beneficial. Well, Charlotte, uh, you have a very remarkable story about how you came to found Makuru Clean Stoves, and I wonder if you could just start by telling us that story, and then, of course, in doing that, telling us a bit about what Makuru Clean Stoves does. Um, thank you. Um, so my name is uh, Charlotte Magai, um, like Justin said, and I'm from Kenya. Um, I grew up in Mukuru. It's one of the biggest slums in Nairobi, and I was orphaned at a really young age. But at 16, I became a mom, and um, we used an inefficient stove to cook. So when my daughter turned two, she suffered a very severe burn injury, and that is the reason why I started um, Mukuru Clean Stoves. We often talk about win-win ideas in the climate SDG space, and Makuru really has uh, a lot of these wins, and I just wonder if you can walk us through you know, exactly how it works, what are the different things that Makuru is de delivering to uh, you know, lower, lower costs, lower air pollution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so a Makuru stove is an Im improvement of the traditional stove, and what it does is it enables families to fight um, you know, household air pollution. So when you use our stove with the right type of fuel, you can reduce up to 90% of the emissions. Um, that also means that the cost of fuel reduces by up to 60%, and it reduces um, the, the risk of accidents in children under the age of five, which is why we started the business in the first place. So initially, I wanted to build a stove that would be stable enough to ensure that if a child below the age of five comes into contact with it, there wouldn't be an accident. But then in doing research and doing that, I realized that wasn't even the bigger, biggest problem my f community was facing. So I had to make a stove that would solve all these three problems and ensure that we can economically empower our community while solving that solution. And so since you've been doing this, uh, tell, tell us how you've scaled. I mean, how many people have, have you reached? How much impact has this had? Um, thank you. We recently just um, won the Ask Short Prize um, last year. Um, thank you. And um, we have currently, um, we currently have a presence in 275,000 households within Western Kenya alone. We are scaling across um, Africa as well, again, with the help of Ask Short and the Global Alliance. And um, essentially what we're trying to do is ensure that as we provide this solution, we are empowering the local communities that we're trying to work with to be able to distribute the solution within the houses that it needs to be in. We work with um, low-income communities, that is our primary target market, and to reach them, this is like low, last, um, you know, um, last mile communities, we have to partner with, with people like lo local women business, business owners, um, local chiefs, you know, local governments to ensure that we have access to the actual people that need the stove, who for reasons like you know, infrastructure um, and, and other um, um, limitations would not um, typically have a stove or have access to that stove. Absolutely, well you, you sort of mentioned it in passing, but one of the win-wins here is the work uh, empowering women. Um, and so I wonder if you could touch a little bit more about that, I, you know, as I understand that you rely 100% on, on women entrepreneurs as, as distribution agents. So why, what was the choice to do that and, and what has been the effect of that on, on these communities? I mean, early on when I started my business, um, I had this uh, quote, I'm not sure who said it, but it goes, you know, the greatest tool for economic development is women empowerment. And um, household air pollution primarily affects women and children. So when you know um, you know, what the impact of dirty cooking is, then you can sell the solution a little bit better. And so we figured how about we partner with the people who are most impacted to try and distribute this solution to as many people as possible. We currently work with 470 local women business owners who distribute our stoves, which are $10, by the way. That is 75% cheaper than a stove with the same type of power, and they earn a 10% commission on every um, stove that they sell. I'm, I want to just ask about this point about the cost, because 
Um, that's clearly an important uh, uh, element of the win-win. And I'm curious to what degree when, you're, when the uh, uh, agents are talking to people, is cost their biggest concern or are they concerned about air pollution? What is the, what is the thing that resonates most with people on the ground? I mean, when you talk about, when you talk to the people in this room, maybe cost is not a factor, but when you talk to a household that earns 40 to $100 monthly income, if you're gonna sell them a product, even if it is life-saving, it has to economically make sense. So cost is always the first question. So that is why when we started um, making a mukuru stove, we had to ensure that that was the first, you know, uh, point um, to, that was the first thing to address. So we sought out to um, basically manufacture our stoves using recycled metal that we get locally. And this ensures that we are able to provide it at a dramatically low cost compared to a stove that does the same work but is imported or maybe made using different products. So I, I want to shift gears a little bit. In the previous sessions, we talked a lot about ecosystems um, and Earthshot Prize, which, again, you, know, again, you, you won. Um, but uh, I'm curious to uh, hear a little bit about the ecosystems that helped you get this off the ground and, and scale it to where you are, you know, the Earthshot Prize being one of them, but, but any others that you found uh, support and, and uh, you know, networking growth opportunities through, how important has that been? Um, it's been crucial. Um, I think um, now I have access to Artshot, I have access to Kati and other ecosystems. But before that, you find that in communities like the one I came from, a lot of us are entrepreneurs because there are no jobs, but also because there's just so many problems to solve. So you find that a lot of young people will turn to entrepreneurship, not just to create jobs, but to create solutions that would help empower that specific um, community. And so there were commun um, an ecosystem just within that community for me. People were already doing something um, you know, something different, maybe something similar, but within that space who would essentially mentor you and teach you how entrepreneurship would work on a very local level. Mm -hmm. So once you have achieved a bit of impact within that community, then we would be able to get out and get access to people outside of our community. But it began, you know, in Mukuru and, and Kibira in slums where we have people like Kennedy Odede who for years they have made solutions to try to, you know, impact the lives within that specific community. And then, and only after you have impacted lives there and realize that your solution is working, then you're able to scale it and get access to larger um, ecosystems. Yeah, it's very, very powerful. I think it's a good reminder that even as we talk about, you know, what can you learn, what can you, well, what not you, but what can one learn from Paris, what can one learn from Silicon Valley, there's actually a lot happening in communities on the ground that we all might be able to learn from. I'm curious, you know, to you to, to hear from you about going from the local community, the local ecosystem that helped uh, get this off the ground, to then this big global platform that you know now have. What were the the sort of institutions that helped in that in between, and then and now you know you're in this on this global stage. Um, I think when you have access to a small group of people who are helping you, you know, learn how you can impact lives and you start to dream a little bit bigger. So now it's not just about providing stoves in Mukuru, it's about providing stoves across Kenya or ac across one county in Kenya. Then you're pushed to get out. And once you get out, because essentially that is your comfort zone, that is where you, everybody understands what you're doing, but now you have to get out of that space and find somebody else who is not within that community. So for me, there were um, you know, communities like SOCAP or YGAP where we would essentially go look for them to try and pitch what we were doing. And for the most part, they didn't understand. Mm. Because if it is not a problem that affects you, then you don't know what I'm talking about. And that is where the discomfort came from, having to tell someone why it's important to back you to provide a solution that they, for instance, do not even realize is something that's needed. But we've had opportunities to get on, you know, those big stages to be pitched to those investors. And we've had some of them come to us, like our very first investor found us in Mukuru in my very small, um, you know, shack. And there was no space. Like there were two seats. He sat there with his, with his daughter and I sat on the table and I pitched him a dream of building a really big factory and asked him for 50,000 US dollars, which then was a, you know, a lot of money for me. But you know, that was my community then. They came to find me and they supported me and enabled me to grow, um, to get outside of Mukuru. Mm. 
Have you found that your, your message needs to change as you go from talking to people at a more local level to at a global level? It always needs to change. Um, I think I found that later on, in the beginning I would just talk about stoves and the impact that it had within the households, but then now you had to integrate climate change. You know, how are your stoves impacting our environment? Is it in a good way or is it in a bad way? And what can you do to ensure that this imp uh, impact is scaled to be able to, you know, empower um, a majority across um, the continent or across the world? So our messaging, our communication has changed um, um, significantly over the years. And now we are not just talking about cook stoves, you're talking about carbon credits, and we are having other you know, conversations like malaria and how we can solve for that using these specific stoves. Well, you recently launched the Makuru Clean Stove Foundation um, to help uh, with education uh, uh, on, on climate change. And so could you just tell us a little bit about what the foundation will do and, and how you're doing it? Um, yeah, so the work that we're going to do with the foundation we're already doing with Mukuru Clean Stoves, we just found that for a solution like improved cook stoves, if you're trying to distribute it in a community that does not even understand that there is a problem, there needed to be education before you're able to accelerate adoption. And so Mukuru Clean Stoves, is com the foundation is coming in to ensure that we are able to educate in mass and ensure that a lot of people get the messaging and understand why a Mukuru stove is very important to be used. But we're also using um, the foundation to develop a new malaria fighting briquette because the solution was a stove for a very long time. We've been doing this for six years. But then we realized that people could burn just anything on the stove. So we needed to come up with a fuel that they could burn on our stoves. And that fuel needed to solve another problem. And we realized that a lot, of, a lot of people catch malaria when they are cooking. So even when they have access to mosquito nets, they still get malaria. So if they are using a mukuru stove, how can our product solve that problem? So we're using the foundation to do research into developing malaria fighting briquettes. And hopefully when that works, we will be able to scale it across the world. It's amazing. Um, uh, I love the you know, the thinking of new products, but they're all impact oriented. It's, it's just such a different, compelling model of, of what, a, what a company can do. I, you know, you, may, you talked about education first, and I, I want to hear a little bit more about what that education looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and then sort of as a second part to that question, how do you inspire uh, uh, more people, particularly women, um, to become entrepreneurs and to, to tackle uh, climate and, and environmental issues? Um, I mean, even with the education, we work with women still. Um, clean cooking, it's not just, I understand that it's not just a women's problem, but it is a problem that women understand best and women can solve for best. So even when we educate, we partner with local women groups. And the reason why we do that is we sell our stoves in rural areas. And in rural areas, in every single market, there is one popular women group. So they are like the influencers within that community. And they are able to communicate or, you know, distribute, um, you know, information a little bit better. So we will partner with them and do little road shows or what we call demos. And what that entails is us setting up, you know, um, our products within the local market during a market day and demonstrating how it works to show you the difference between a mukuru stove and a traditional stove or an open fire and working with these women to be able to do that because then they trust the product if it is coming, you know, if the information is coming from the women that they trust most or the women who essentially have been able to distribute products to them and they've been able to see that there is a difference. So that is how we do the work and how we inspire people um, I think on your previous panel, you were talking about storytelling and allowing young people to tell their stories. Is when you tell a story, like I am doing this job and maybe we won the ad shot, but this is where we came from. We came from Mukuru, from very humble beginnings. And there's a young girl who wants to start a business. Then they see that there is a way. They see that, you know, in the end, they will be able to achieve the impact that they're trying to achieve or they will be able to achieve something. So just storytelling is very big for us at Mukuru and very big for me personally. Just always reminding people that it might look like this, but this is where it began. And you can always start from somewhere. And that is the biggest tool that I have used to um, inspire young people, especially.
Absolutely, it's very, very inspirational. I, I'm curious, I mean, obviously here, you're here telling the story. How do you get that story to, to communities, the people you know, who, who may be uh, you know, where you were uh, not so long ago? How do you get that story out there? Um, we work with them. We work within those communities. So, um, for instance, young people who are doing something like weaving, you know, to provide, uh, just make a living, or be able to provide for their families. We're able to provide mentorship programs for them. We're able to have conversations with them about what that could look like, and it doesn't always need to scale. Right. As long as you're doing something that impacts a life, it doesn't need to impact a thousand lives right now. It can always just impact one or two lives, as long as it's able to make a difference. So reaching out to people, for instance, in Mukuru, where I came from, always ensuring that you go back to try to communicate the importance of creating solutions within that community or even in a different community just to try and always impact lives. Because as we have seen over the years, in the beginning it was you have to make a profit and then impact will come later. But we're seeing more and more that changing, that you can make impact and profit can follow. And it can follow in a big way. So it doesn't, you, it, impact doesn't have to be the first thing that's on the table. I, I mean, profit doesn't have to be the first thing that's on the table. You can always begin with impact and look into making profit, uh, profit a bit later. Begin with impact, that's great. I, I wanna ask about, you mentioned carbon credits, obviously really complicated, um, in some ways controversial uh, area, but how are you navigating that and, and what is the potential to help you really scale uh, with these carbon credits? I mean, you were talking about greenwashing and a lot of things are complicated, um, especially in the climate space. But what we are trying to achieve, uh, for instance, at Mukuru is to provide a stove that is able to reduce emissions, essentially reduce carbon emissions. And so if we can leverage carbon credits to ensure that we get that stove into as many households at pos as possible, as long as there is accountability, you know, and as long as, again, you're focusing on impact, not the amount of money you could make from that, it's always very beneficial. So at Mukuru, what we do is we sell um, our clean cook stoves, and the credit from that is sold to be able to sell more stoves out there. So essentially, the plan is for every stove that we sell, we should be able to get another stove um, within the next household um, by use of uh, revenues of Chrome carbon credits. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's, a great, that's a great ratio. You sell one and get another. Um, we've talked uh, quite a bit about the various things that, that you're working on, that are, but I want to give you one other opportunity to cover anything else that's on your mind that's coming next, that's you know, what, you know, what your plans are for the coming, uh, coming few years. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just talking to you about malaria fighting briquettes. I think that is what we are most excited about um, at Mukuru because it's going to be able to solve so many problems, but two specifically, you know, household air pollution, but malaria as well. So we are in the process of, you know, R&D for this um, specific product. We're getting a lot of help from Cartier and Earthshot and other partners. And the reason why I'm so excited about this is because we feel like we've gotten to a point where our communities are starting to accept and understand the benefits of clean cooking and more and more of them are looking to adopt, you know, clean cook stoves. So we feel like this is the right time to come in and introduce a new fuel and ensure that they're able to, um, you know, adopt that as well. But this is the one product that we are 100% sure will not just stay in the African continent. We can distribute this, you know, in Europe. We can distribute it in the U.S. Um, you know, for those of us who go camping and are always looking for fuels that can do two for one, we're talking about young people, especially millennials and Gen Z, who are focused on change. Like, how is the product that I'm using impacting my environment? So we're not just banning whatever it is we can ban so we can get a good barbecue. We care about what we're going to be banning. And I'm excited that Mukuru Clean Stoves is in a position to be able to be a part of that journey, you know, with the next generation. We're excited that we are not just providing a solution that is specifically, you know, for low income, but we're able to reach, you know, um, higher earning customers who might even be able to subsidize the cost for the people that need it the most. So I know you're still in R&D, but what is this going to look like? Are you going to go to communities around the world and engage in the same way, you know, talking to... Uh, you know, people who are who are who are buying the fuel around the world, or what? What does the scale of this look like? It's quite exciting. 
Um, so that's the thing. The scale of it is 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 pretty much worldwide. With stoves, you look at you know sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, maybe even Latin America. But with this fuel, you look at a global market. The beauty of it is when you burn, um, you know, a mukuru fuel, it's gonna be turning your household into essentially a mosquito repellent zone. So that is saving your life. And when a camper goes maybe camping in the US and he buys this specific stove, he doesn't have to you know, be fighting insects you know, um, uh, within that, that forest or whatever it is, that where, whatever place he goes camping. So it's going to look like a product that is making the life of millennials in America easier and more fun, and they feel like they are creating or they are participating in the protection of the environment while ensuring that low, um, you know, earning communities are able to benefit from the same product, but for them it is a life-saving product. So it is providing very different, um, you know, solutions for different demographics, but at the end of the day, we have enough reach to be able to create significant impact. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Charlotte, for this conversation. Very inspirational. I, I learned a lot, and frankly, just it's inspiring to see going from a real local solution to global impact. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for having me.